Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kishanu Mitzvah Mitzvahanu Lasu Ivrei Torah. Praise to you, Lord of God, rule of the universe, who has made us toy with your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. So, as our sheet is loading, today we're going to be studying attitude of gratitude in Judaism. This is an idea that appears frequently in our tradition both in the idea of the Jewish value of Hakarat HaTov, appreciating the good, but in other ways as well. So we're gonna start with what it means to be a Jew. The word Jew comes from Judah. Judah was one of the 12 sons of Jacob in the Torah and the book of Genesis. And he gets his name because his mother Leah says, I will thank the Lord. And therefore she names him Yehuda. Yehuda being related to Toda, meaning thank you. So to be a Jew is to be a thanks giver. Something to think about. One of the places where this comes up is Bir Karamazam. Birkan Mazon is the blessing that we say after we eat meals with bread. It comes from a verse in Deuteronomy. When you eat and you are satisfied, then you will give thanks to the Lord your God for the good land which God has given you, which given that people had to grow their own food, was shorthand for saying, thank you, God, for giving me land so I can have food. Today, be like saying, give thanks to God for the source of income by which you can buy food at the grocery store. That morphed in the Talmud to Bir Karamazon, which this is the first paragraph of it. Basically, it is an extended way of saying thank you to God for the food that we have to eat. Questions about your Karamazon or being a Thanksgiver? I find that interesting because I heard on the news today that the church in Chicago it may close down a food pantry that is serving 400 people because they want to sell the property to somebody else. Hmm. Is that God providing food for the people? I don't think so. That's a question that Jews have wrestled with. The idea of praise to you, O Lord, who gives food to all. It seems hypocritical to say that God gives food to everybody when there are hungry people around. And so for me, the way that I can say these words with a straight face is by interpreting it as God provides the food for everybody. We grow enough food to feed everybody on this planet. It's up to us humans to partner with God to distribute it to the people who need it. The people who supposedly serve God or work with God in the Catholic Church are doing just the, are heading in the wrong direction, supposedly, from what they said on the news today. In the spirit of Pirkei Avot, chapter one, Mishnah six, where Rabbi Joshua ben Parachias says that you should give everybody the benefit of the doubt I will hope that they are planning on using the proceeds from the sale of that land to further the mission of helping those in need in some even better fashion. What it is, I don't know. 
Okay, here you go. Other questions or thoughts about beer karma zone or being a Thanksgiver? I yes, uh, Ashray, the, the one line where you open your hand and you, know, you favor all, favor the living and give food to everybody, sustain everyone is sustained. But I don't know why they always do it. But just when I sit down to dinner, I you, know, you get the news of the little babies in Somalia that are really hanging on, like a everybody's starving, and all the areas where there's famine. I sort of go after herbs thoughts, but I really wrestle with that line and with that that whole concept because it's out there and it's, you know, if we're all created in God's image, why are some basically even living long enough to endure, to, to make it through life, to make it through the first year? And, yep. um, so I, there's no answer. I'm just I'm not looking. I know that I don't know there's an answer, but there are food banks and organizations out there trying to help, but there's so many who need it who can't get it. That's all. <laughs> Just that's it's hard, hard to find a place for it all. That's true. There's Two thoughts that I have drawing on Jewish tradition for this, assuming I can remember both of them. One is that in the Talmud, it poses the question of what does it, what does the book, the verse in Deuteronomy mean when it says you should walk in God's ways? And the answer that provides in Sota is that you should emulate God. So just as God provided clothes for those in need with Adam and Eve, so should we. Just as God visited the sick with Abraham, so should we. Just as God took care of the dead with Moses, so should we. So in Deuteronomy, chapter 14 or 15, it says the poor, there will always be poor in the land. There'll be those, always be those in need in your land. Therefore you should open your hand and be generous to them. And when we say this line in both Ashray and in Bir Karmazon, Potecha Yedecha must be a little talking about God as opening God's metaphorical hand, it is meant to remind us to imitate God and open our hand and be generous. At the same time, in Pirkei Avot, probably chapter two, Rabbi Tarfon says, You don't have to finish the job, but you cannot ignore it either. So when you strive to finish a job like world hunger, then it becomes so, so overwhelming that's paralyzing. But when you say, this is a big problem, this is a massive problem, I can't fix it for everybody, but I can make a difference, then you are take then you become one more person making a difference it's like the starfish story where there's an old man walking on the beach and he sees all miles of starfish that have washed up at high tide and they're all drying out and then he sees a little girl who appears to be dancing when he gets closer he sees that she's throwing starfish back into the ocean and he asks her how she can possibly hope to make a difference because there are miles of starfish just on this one beach and there are so many beaches around the world. 
And she picks up another starfish, throws it in the ocean and says, I made a difference to that one. Hmm. So you're right, it's a big problem. And Jewish tradition would suggest that we each do what we can, making sure to take care of ourselves as well. Thanks for another, that would be another peer cave of quick saying about, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? You have to make sure you have enough money for yourself, but then you, you do what you can with others, to help others. So you say we can't ignore it. If we could define the very poorest person in the land, mm -hmm. that person would also have to be giving tzedakah. Is that correct? That is correct. Every, every, at least everybody who holds by Jewish tradition or Jewish law is supposed to help, is supposed to give tzedakah to others, but it does not necessarily have to be monetary. It could be in the form of a kind word or a smile or something that makes a person's day. Thank you. I have a question related to that. Yeah. What about B'nai Noach in the land? Like Noachites, are they obligated mm -hmm. to some kind of tzedakah in terms of like an obligation in the land? I don't think so. Mm. But, but they're encouraged, but, but they're not obligated. Presumably they they would they would want to anyways, but yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. No, mm -hmm. B'nai Noach or Noachides are those who adhere to a few basic rules that were said to be given to the descendants of Noah. So something to think about on Thanksgiving is one saying thank you to God after you've eaten, whether it's a full beer cut on his own, or it's a short version like hubba hubba hubba, thank you for the grubba, yay God, or anything in between, or just a let's take a moment to acknowledge God. That is a Jewish way of celebrating Thanksgiving. Additionally, another good thing to do, which Birkan Mazon encourages us to do, is to think about not only giving thanks to God, but to the people who are responsible for us having our meal. And a good exercise is to take one dish and see how many people you can trace back who contributed to that dish being on your table. So farmers, truck drivers, factory workers, more truck drivers, grocery, grocery store workers. If you didn't cook the meal, whoever did cook the meal, a lot of people. And then Birkan Mazon would encourage us to at least say thank you to those who we can reach. Yes, the recipe author. Um, so you may not be able to, you know, say thank you to the truck drivers, although I've tried to change my, my mental view of truck drivers when I encounter them on the road, what with supply chain issues and trying to be aware that they are possibly helping me personally. Um, but it's something to think about. The uh, farmers in Mexico. What? Oh, yes, the farmer is not in the United States. And here's a link to a musical version with harmony. So you can encounter that later. All right, let's move on to Moda Ani. So Moda Ani is the first thing that we say when we wake up. And it thanks God for returning our soul. When this prayer was written, people believed that when you were asleep, your soul went off and had adventures. And when you, and then in the morning, if you were lucky, your soul came back to you. And so this idea of starting the day with gratitude is potentially a game-changing one. Because if you're already saying, thank you, God, that I have another day, then 
then that's a different frame of mind than waking up and being angry at the alarm clock. So that's how we start our day with gratitude. And then we have God. here, what? We thank God and still be angry at the alarm clock. That's right, exactly. Thank you, God, that we can be, that we're here to be angry at the alarm clock. Questions about Modani? Yeah, actually, I have a quick question about that. Um, mm -hmm. Is this a rabbinic commandment or a Torah level commandment to say this? I believe rabbinic. I don't know that I don't know that the Torah knew of Moda and I I I read thank you. I, I read that that it's really a 16th century uh, statement. I, I think it's a very beautiful one. Uh, but and that it replaces something else I don't remember what uh, that people used to do. Um, so that it's actually modern from our viewpoint. I, I don't, I don't know right. the history of it. I think the Hashivenu is from around that period, around the 16th century, isn't it? Hashivenu is already mentioned certainly in the Torah, uh, not in the Torah, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, possibly in the Mishnah, oh, because there's a discussion where they say that you have to attach Ga'al Yisrael, which is at the end of Micha Mocha, to the Amidah. And then the question is posed, but what about Hashkivenu? And they say, well, it's really one long Ga'al Yisrael blessing. So I believe Hashkivenu is significantly older. But that having been said, it may have morphed and added and changed its form over time. So it's basically out of something else. Oh, I'm sorry. It's basically what? It, it basically kind of just to understand what you said. It kind of like grew out of something else. This this possibly did. Modani, possibly. Yeah. I will I will look into it and report back with whatever I can find. Thank you. Yep. Do we say this on uh, Shabbat too? Yep. Every day that you wake up. Okay. <laughs> So this is, so some things like Birkot HaShachar, the, um, the daily, the morning blessings, um, or in the reform terminology, Nisecha Shel Yom, something like that. Um, the, they were originally in the time of the Talmud, they were blessings that you said when you opened your eyes and put your feet on the ground and put on your hat. And then they eventually got moved into the morning service. But Moda Ani is something that is supposed to be individual and is therefore not even in some cedarim under the theory that people don't sleep with a cedar next to them usually. Um, and for women, you would say Moda Ani. So there are a variety of terms for this. Possibly the most famous one was written by Kolpis Seder, which is made up of cantor Jeff Klepper and Rabbi Danny Freelander. But there was a Texas style one, which was written by Harold Messenger. Mode ani, mode ani, le fanecha, le fanecha, melechai, melechai, o vikayam, vikayam, shehechazarta, finishmati, vicham la rabba emuna techa. So that was the one that we did at Camp Down in the South. Then there's the version of You Are My Sunshine. Moda ani lefanecha melechai vekayam shehechazarta binishmati 
That one, I don't know who came up with putting that together, but here's a version of it. Um, Nefesh Mountain, which is a Jewish bluegrass group, they have a version of Moda Ani. And Joe Buchanan, who is a Jewish country music musician, <laughs> has a version of Moda Ani as well. So lots of things to consider. <laughs> All right, moving on, Benching Gomel. So Benching is it is for blessing. And Gomel is, I believe, redemption um, or something of that sort. So it is a prayer that we say, it goes back to the time of the Talmud, when you've been saved from some sort of life-threatening situation. In the time of the Talmud, it was traveling across the sea, crossing the wilderness, those who were sick and recovered, and those who were imprisoned and released. Today, it's more likely to be something like childbirth, visiting Israel, or surgery or other recuperation from major illness, or after you've been in an accident, God forbid. So the way this works is after you, is you have an aliyah where you say the Torah blessings, and after the Torah is read and you say the blessing after, then you say a line and the congregation says it back. It says a line in response to you. Um, basically, thank you, God, for helping me through the situation. And the response is, may God who helped you through the situation, um, I believe, continue to help you in the future. Questions about benching Gomel? All yes. of those. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. All right, thank, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to say Modani. I, I didn't even know it had a tune. I, I, I've, I'd say it in the morning, but I, I didn't know that it had a tune. Now I have to choose one of 12 tunes <laughs> instead of just saying. Uh, um, but go mail. There's one of the Psalms in the morning. Maybe it's just on Shabbos. I, I don't know. That's when I do it. It ends with the words, I think, uh, uh, it's some praise of God. Ki gamal alai, for mm -hmm. he has, he ha, for he has uh, been favorable unto me. I mean, that's the same root, is it not the yes, same Yes, that root? would be the same root. Okay, so. After, I don't know, ki gamal alai. So is there, um, is that unrelated to gamal with a different vowel, the camel? Is it like two words that have the same, they're homophones or something, but they don't have. Any relation? Yes. Yes. Um, Ashiro Adonai ki gamalai. I will sing to God because God yeah. has been favorable to me. Um, is a homophone. Um, it does not mean I will sing to God because God has been my camel. Right. Um, in the same way that in the Friday night Psalms, Yoshev Kruvim Tanu Ta'aretz means. Um, God sits in judgment on the earth. It does not mean that the cabbages sit in judgment of the earth. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, homophones in Hebrew as well as in English. Yeah, I thought of it as for there is, I will sing to the Lord for there is a camel on top of me. Uh, yes. But, okay. So, that... so David, the wilderness, the sea and illness are dangers which can take our lives supposedly. But why sing Goma on visiting Israel? That what would be the danger there. Travel. You're cross. You're crossing the sea. Well, what if I were going there from uh, some other place on the continent without crossing the sea? Then you're crossing the wilderness. Hmm. <clears throat> Interesting. David. Yeah. But isn't the Gomel said after you return from visiting Israel? Yes. So then that also has that other element of a lower level of sanctity. I mean, it's the travels complete, but returning from Israel is a lower level of sanctity. Yes. You know, the, so that might be a piece of it too. Hmm. That's possible. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, let's move on to blessings of enjoyment. So we have this quote in the Talmud that says, any, where Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says, anyone who derives benefit from this world without a blessing, it is, as, it is as if they stole from God. So this idea that God, ha, like God is the master of the world, Adon Olam, and the world is God's and everything in it. And so we need to give thanks to God for when we enjoy something in it. So we start with an example of Osei Ma'asev Reshit. This is the blessing for saying something large in nature, like mountains, the sunset. I say it every time I see one when I see Lake Michigan. Um, there is a different blessing for seeing individual things in nature, like a particularly beautiful flower. And the idea here is that when you see something in nature, you should be acknowledging it and thanking God for it. Another example of thanking God is the food blessings. For example, Bure Priya Eats, the blessing for eating things that come from trees. So saying a blessing every time we eat helps us become better at saying thank you, and it strengthens the gratitude muscles, so to speak. And again, the idea that we should be thanking God and also people who are involved in the food that we eat or the myriad of other things that people do for us. Bus drivers, taxi drivers, Uber, Uber drivers, car mechanics, however you get around, bikes, bike mechanics, but doctors, for example. All right, questions about these blessings. All right, we'll move on. Shachianu. So praise to you, Lord, our God, rule the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this time. So there are a couple of different situations or buckets of situations in which you would say this. One of them would be really big moments when you're grateful to have been alive for it, like when your child is born. Another category would be moments where you do something for the first time, like the first time that you drive a car. And the third category would be the first time you do something in a year, like lighting candles on the first night of Hanukkah. Normally there are two blessings when we light candles, on the first night there are three. So there are different aspects of gratitude that are happening here. The first one would just be a simple, thank you, God, for keeping me alive to reach this point in time. And particularly when we are talking about doing something for the first time in a year, sometimes it's hard to think like, okay, I get the idea that Shekhan is for the first time. Why are we saying that if we just said Shekhan last year when we lit Hanukkah candles? But we're acknowledging that, thank you God, that you kept us alive so we could reach this point again this year. Another aspect of gratitude is this idea that when you thank God for helping you to get to a situation like the first time that you drive a car, you're recognizing that you didn't just do it on your own. God gave you traits, that helped you get there. God gave you people to help you. It's like when people accept an Oscar awards, they thank all the people who helped them. 
So by saying the Shech Yanu, we are remember we're saying thank you to God and it's reminding us to say thank you to people as well. <laughs> Questions about Why don't we say that every morning when we get up? Is it saved for grander occasions that are more that don't happen every day or <laughs> Why, yes, I think why, why is it different when you you're thankful that you opened your eyes and you got to that point again? I think that Moda Ani functions in the same fashion of thank you God that I got here again. Saying the Shekh Yanu every day would make it a little less special. It's also a plural. So maybe the communal is part of the Shekhyan. Yeah, sometimes some Shekhyan moments are done communally. Um, one of the things that I do when I prepare students for their bar and bat mitzvah ceremonies is I make sure they know the Shekhyan so that if they are called upon to say it with their family in front of the community, they can do that. And it can be said individually, even though it's communal, even though the even though the language is communal, you you can you can say it on your own even when you don't have other people around. Good noticing about the communal aspect, though. I had not picked up on that before. David, my family has a custom that on your birthday you say Shachianu. Uh, when you get up, thanking God that you had another year, you survived another year. And even though it's in a plural here, I'm thinking now that when I say it, I, I think of myself, thank you, God, and God's help. I also think of all those who cheered for me that allowed me to be in the next year of my life. So that's why we say Shafiana on birthday. That's beautiful. Thank you, Linda. All right, so looking at tunes, the most common tune for Shekh Yanu is written by Tzvika Pick. Baruch atah adashnai aloheinu melech ha'olam shtehefi yanu v'kimanu v'higi yanu Lazman Hazem, Amen. He wrote that back in 1974. There's also the Jewish American rock group Safam, who wrote a version of Shechianu. Shechianu. Vikiamanu, Vihigianu, Lazma, Vikimanu, Vihigianu, Lazman Hazem. Sounds better with the whole set of instruments behind. You can hear it on the YouTube video. All right, moving on to the Amida. So the Amida has three blessings at the beginning, three blessings at the end, and then 13 blessings in the middle on a weekday, and one super long blessing in the middle on Shabbat and on holidays, including the high holidays. The thing in the middle changes depending on when on Shabbat it is, when on morning or evening, that sort of thing. However, regardless of whether it's a Shabbat, a weekday, a holiday, we have a blessing at one of the last three about giving thanks to God because that's important enough to get mentioned every day regardless of what else is going on. So, there's a Debbie Freeman tune for it, which I'm blanking on right now. 
but I'm sure it will come back to me later. And there's a tune written by Cantor Mayor Finkelstein, Be'al Kulam, Be'al Kulam, Am Yitbarach Be'yitromam, Shimcha. It goes on from there. So this is something that, again, we say every day, so giving thanks to God. Questions about, or questions or comments about Modim? <laughs> May I ask just a little bit of a general question, David? Yeah. So when you wrote this short source sheet, because there are all these musical references and all these texts, did you write it over a period of time and you keep improving it and then updating it on Safari? Or did you write it in an intense burst of creativity and research? An intense burst <laughs> today and yesterday. <laughs> oh, and so then I know it, it's not like asking about favorite children. So I just peeked you have 103 sheets on Safari. Do mm -hmm. you have favorites? I, to me, this is re a really great one of thank yours. You. Thank you. I am partial to the one that I, the ones that I wrote about the origins of Hanukkah customs and Purim customs because. I never knew the history behind latkes, sufganiyot, and dreidels, for instance. Um, but, oh, and um, also one I did last year about the Jewish connections to Thanksgiving, which I'll send out this week. Um, so I like those a lot, but this is also a good one. I try to talk about, I try to teach topics that I enjoy and that I hope people will find interesting. All right, let's keep going. Asher Yatsar. So, there's a blessing for everything, including going to the bathroom. But we say it after we leave the bathroom. <laughs> and this one is a blessing that's important because it's easy to take for granted that our body works and works without pain until all of a sudden it doesn't. <sighs> And so this blessing says, basically, God, thank you for creating our bodies as well as you did. And if one of the things that was supposed to be open is closed, or one thing that's supposed to be closed is open, we'd have a lot of trouble. So thank you, God, for things working as well as they do. And Again, particularly with health, it's easy to take things to recognize how good we have things only after we don't have them quite as well. And this is Judaism's way of urging us to be grateful for what we have while we still have it. So David, the Orthodox, mm -hmm. I understand now hearing all this why they don't have time to do much work and or you know, just study because they're so busy saying all these prayers. And I bet they do say every single one, right? Yeah. yeah. And that takes up a good part of the day. Um, when you say it, when you say it every day, you get faster at saying it. Faster and faster. Okay. <laughs> yes. So there are tunes for this, like oh. many other things. This one was written by, there's one written by Debbie Friedman. Mm -hmm. This particular video by some cantors in the United Kingdom, and then goes on to another tune that she wrote uh, both in 1995, um, thanking God for our soul from the tune for El Hai Neshama. Uh, Dan Nichols also wrote a tune, and Rabbi Josh Warshawski, who is a Chicago-based um, young Jewish musician, next generation or two after W. Friedman and Dan Nichols, he wrote one as well. This one, I believe, was in 2020, 
back when everybody did these compiled music videos. To Norma's point about all these blessings. <laughs> blessings. So in the Talmud, Rabbi Mayer is quoted as saying that a person should say a hundred blessings every day. Which he comes up with by making a pun about a verse in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, it's not even a switching out the vowels pun, um, interpretation. It's just a close sound pun to use the technical term in penology. Questions about this idea of saying 100 blessings. Does it matter what? No. Blessings? No. You saying the daily services plus the blessings for eating a couple times a day should get you close, if not all the way there. Presumably a Sherry Tsar would also help with your count after you go to the bathroom. Um, but no. The idea is shoot for the moon and if you miss you'll land amongst the stars when it comes to saying thank you to God. If you're saying a hundred blessings every day normally, when you have a holy day or a rush or a chodesh, it would seem to me you will well exceed the hundred. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. This is not a this is not one with a maximum on it. If I can intrude here, just saying three weekday Amitas is going to get you more than halfway there. <laughs> That's true. Nineteen times three gets you to 57. And Bir Kodashachar should get you another 15 or so. So yeah, this one seems harder, seems hard, but once you get into it, it's gets easier. The more challenging thing is being mindful to still be grateful and not just take, not just say these words by rote and forget the meaning behind them. We have here a story which you can read later, but it's about a guy who um, was cursed with the curse of blessings and he had to say a blessing a day in order to stay alive. And so this helped transform his life as he looked for things to say thank you for. And I will now zip ahead so that you have to come back to it to find out the ending. All right, uh, um, Sukkot. So we built a sukkah because God said to, or it says so in the Torah. And the Torah says this because we lived in booths when we left Egypt, they were easy to put up and take down as we're slipping through the desert. However, there are other reasons why we build Sukkot, why we build Sukkot. So in addition to this idea that we are thankful to God for having taken care of us in the past, when we were going through the desert, like Passover and Shavuot, in addition to a historical reason for the holiday, there's an agricultural reason for the holiday and that it is, it's a harvest holiday. So, in order for the Jews, when they were living in the land of Israel, to save time and not waste har valuable harvest time going back and forth to their homes, they built huts next to the fields. So they could harvest until it got too dark, and then they could wake up as soon as it was late enough and get back to work and make sure that they had more food for their family for the next season. So by building a sukkah, it reminds us to be grateful for the food that we have that we have enough food to get us through the next season, the next time period. Additionally, 
sukkahs are meant to be temporary housing. They are not meant to be permanent structures. If you make it too permanent, it's no longer a kosher sukkah. And so sukkahs serve as a reminder of those who don't have permanent or stable housing to go back to. That we can go back into our homes if it starts to rain, but not everybody is that fortunate. And so by, have, by building or being in a sukkah, it reminds us to be grateful for what we have and to use the financial blessings with which we have been blessed to help others who are not as fortunate as us. Questions about Sukkot? All right, seeing none, I'm going to keep moving because I want to make sure we get through this in the time that we have. Ah, here's a video about um, the Frozen song, Do You Want to Build a Snowman? But it's Do You Want to Build a Sukkah? <laughs> um, written by the by Rabbi Rach Weiss, who oh. is married to the new director, Rabbi Jonah Rank, of the Hebrew Seminary for the Deaf in Skopje. Oh. So this is a fun video to watch. <laughs> All right, Diana. So the Passover song, Dayenu, this is the long, this is the full version of it. It's more than just the three verses. Basically says, if God had done this thing for us, but not the next step, Dayenu, it would have been enough for us. For instance, if God had split the sea and not taken us through to dry land, Dayenu, that would have been enough. Which on the one hand, would it really have been enough? But on the other hand, the message here seems to be that we should be grateful for the good things that do happen for us, even if we were hoping for more. That seems to be the message with Dayenu. And here we have the Maccabees, oh, who have a brilliant video mm -hmm. where they set Dayenu to a variety of musical styles complete with different costumes. <laughs> so I encourage watching this and then sending yourself a reminder to come back to it before Passover. All right, moving on to the Psalm for Shabbat. So every day of the week has a Psalm according to the Mishnah and that the Levites would sing in the temple. Psalm 92 is a Psalm that they would sing on Shabbat. Tov l'hodot l'adonai l'zamerashim chaoyon. It is good to thank the Lord to sing uh, to your to your name almost high. That's this is part of the Friday night service. There's a tune written for this by Rabbi Shlomo Krobach. Tov lahodo ladoshem. Tov lahodo ladoshem. Uzamer, Uzamer, Lashim Chayon, Tov, Tov, Lahod, Ladoshem, and it goes on from there. This is a version by the Jewish Acapella group Sheer Soul. There are also links for a uh, girls' high school group and um, a link for you to hear Karbach himself singing. Just a one. And then there is a much lesser known version by uh, Kolpa um from 1974. Hallel. Moving on. In Hallel, which we will come back to, not tonight. Psalm 118, we have Hodu Adonai Kitov, Kiyoan Pasto. Thank the Lord for God is good. God's steadfast love is eternal. There are a variety of tunes for this. It tends to have, there are signature tunes for each of the major festivals, Passover, Sukkot, and Shavuot. And then there are other tunes as well that are done for this. Um, so here's our holiday reminder to give thanks to God. Um, this is a tune by um, Debbie, Friedman. Debbie Friedman, recorded by the Platt Brothers. Oh, 
And then there's some English as well. Uh, the One of them, Ben Platt, was a Broadway star in Dear Evan Hansen. He grew up at Camp Ramah and got his acting career, acting start there. Uh. All right, moving on. Eo Devarim. So this is something that we say at the beginning of the weekday morning service. Um, and it's about the things for which there's no minimum and no max, sorry, that there's no maximum for what you can do. I bring this text because it refers to the Bikurim. The Bikurim were the first fruits that the Jews, when they were farmers, would bring to the temple as a way of saying, thank you to God for me having enough food for my family. Uh, um, and they get referenced here. Mm -hmm. And then again, there's a turn. And it goes on from there. That's by Kolba Setter again. And that's it. So, oh, and then there's, X, and then there are appendixes. Perfect so, timing. <laughs> thank you. Um, so appendix A is a recap of some of these in paragraph form if you prefer to go through the paragraphs. And Appendix B is two other rabbis thoughts about gratitude, Rabbi David Teutsch and um, former uh, chief rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi of Great Britain. All right, questions about all this in the last minute that we have. Very Thank you. Yeah, amazing that you put it all together. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank you. David. Yes, thank you. It was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, everyone.